can see our, our text is in Matthew chapter 20. Actually, the whole passage really begins up there with verse 17. So you'll be familiar with it. I love you. I love you. Now, when one of my kids would come to me and say that, it'd say, "Uh uh-huh, what do you want? What do you want? But today we are talking about a a serving revolution. Serving revolution. It gives us opportunity to invite people to serve. It also provides us opportunity to to celebrate and to give thanks for the servant heart of the people of our congregation. And both of those are necessary. Now, I just think about just what's really, really fresh right in front of me is the last three days where we had, um, where we, where people were invested in the food pantry ministry. Let me tell you something. That's a lot of work. That's quite a commitment. It begins, (laughs) amen. It begins with, uh, yeah, jo- Joey is, is, uh, is uh, it's gotten to, to Josie, <laughs> kind of rubbing off on her. Uh, Josie's a part of the food pantry. We have uh, people come up here on Thursday and help unload and get everything ready and set up the room. Uh, they and others show up on Friday and, and, and serve members of our community, people who come, dear friends. And on Saturday, uh, others come, some all three days, same ones, different ones come and and serve and and love and pray with and talk to and hear the concerns and be the presence of Jesus to those that God gives us. It's a blessing. I want to tell you, I want to tell you that um, I really appreciate all the people who are invested in that. And that's just one, one, uh, one of those ministries. I, uh, but this, this particular month, January for food pantry was Laurie Willis's first, first time as a director for our food pantry. (laughs) She didn't read the fine print says, now director until Jesus returns. You know, that's fine print. Did a fine job. But I mentioned her, this is not to, you know, not, not to just to, to isolate her, but to say this is the kind of spirit that really blesses us. Because when we need somebody, God provides. And we needed someone, and, and, and with others, we began to pray and look and and then someone would ask and then came down to, Laurie, do you, you feel that you could do this? She said, not only do I feel like I, I, sh- I, I, I want, want to do it, I feel called to do it. That was a blessing. It gives us opportunity to celebrate everybody that is the, the, the servant heart of our church, whether it's the music ministry and, or, or working with children and or youth, or, or the tech, or, 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 or providing meals, or what, whatever it is. I don't want to leave anybody else. All are so extremely important. And so we, we thank you. We, we, you are the backbone. We, we rise to the level of the commitment of the people that God has, has given us. And, uh, and, and, and I'm, I'm so very thankful. Thank you. Um, We need you and we need others. So it's okay to say to your neighbor, he's coming after you today. It's okay. Go ahead and say that. He's coming after you today. Okay. In uh, 1985, 1985 was the first first year of full-time pastoral ministry for me. It was my first church. I went into that church, into that, that place of service with a unnerving statistic that 20% of people on average do 80% of the work and 80% of the giving in the life of 
any congregation on the average. And, and I, I kept thinking when I went into that first full-time church, this is unacceptable. It's unacceptable. Um, and, and I went in there and kept service and serving before the people. In 2009, just a little over 10, 10 years ago, the Barna Group presented a statistic that things are worse. That now it is 10% is doing 90% of the work, service, and giving. 10% doing 90%. Again, I think that's un- unacceptable. And then of that same survey, 50% of church members said they have no interest in serving at all. And we understand that things are very complicated in our day. At least we think, well, this is to our day, right? It hasn't been complicated with anybody else. But what we do know is, is that, man, we live in a, in a, a time of t- tremendous transition where it is possible for a person to to move three to five times in their adulthood, in their adult life. So people are constantly transitioning in and out of community. Then um, we, most households are two career families. So moms and dads are working and, and trying to make ends meet and pay bills and take care of kids if they have children. And then we live in this 24-7 society, and there are so many things that are vying for our time. There are so many things that keep us busy that are pulling us here and there. And because we're mobile, we are able to travel everywhere and go anywhere at any time. And then we have these two grizzly bears that we are wrestling with constantly. One of those is this the sense of entitlement, where people come and they, they feel like things are to be given to them, that it ought to be free, it ought to be just assured, to be, a, be always there for them without doing much in return. They, it's about receiving, but not much giving. And then the other grizzly bear that we wrestle with all the time is, is this um, consumer mentality. And it's different because the consumer mentality says, I demand of you that you do things for me. And if if you don't have these things, if you don't have this kind of style of this or that, then we just go down the road to somewhere else. And there's no commitment to the life of a congregation. No commitment. Uh, Somebody somebody described it, it's it's like a buffet line where you, you get your plate in your hand and you start in the buffet line, but you don't, you don't pile it up just quick because there might be something better over there. And if, and, if, and, if, and if it doesn't suit, then I'll just go somewhere else. And so there's this call for commitment. You think about somebody... Somebody comes across the, the parking lot and they, they look down and say, there's some trash in the parking lot there. Somebody needs to pick that up. They, they go into the nursery area and they drop off their kid and they see that there's one worker in there and there's, there's six or seven kids in there and they say, somebody needs to help in there. They, they come into the front door and there's nobody there to greet them and tell them how special they are. This is, the, this is what I want to share with you. This is the burden of this message. That a serving revolution, a serving revolution begins with a cause worth giving your life for. A serving revolution begins with a cause Worth laying your life down for. With, worth giving your life for. I'm going to tell you something. Buildings and brick and mortar is not worth my life. Um, maintaining vans is not worth my life. Putting new carpet and, and new padding on pews is not worth my life. It's not worth your life. See, that's, that's not the cause that brings us together. 
Uh, that, that's the provision of a beautiful building or, or tools that are used. But we have a greater cause than that, something worth laying our lives down. It is, it is the, the, the call of Jesus to lay down our life for him and to follow him. That he is worth laying our lives down for. That he didn't call us together to, uh, to ensure the survival that First Baptist Church will be here in 10 years or 20 years or 30 years from now. That is not our call. But it's, it's hearing his first sermon in Mark's gospel, when he arrived on the scene, he said, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. That we are a, a people of Jesus. Amen? We're a people of Jesus. We are disciples and followers of Jesus. Called to serve, to serve him, to serve others as a family of faith on mission as missionaries in the world and with the people around us. We serve each other and we serve those. So everything that we do in here, everything that goes on in here is preparation to serve the Lord, lay down our lives for Him, and to be on mission with Him outside there. And that's a call and a cause worth laying your life down for, worth laying my life down for. Um, in, uh, it, when I went to a, a, another church as pastor, I'd been there for about two or three weeks, and the chairman of deacons came in and sat in my office, and he handed me a piece of paper. Um, and, I, and on it was, was all this list of things to do. And I said, what is this? He called it the list. And he said, this is all the things that the, pre the previous pastor did on Sunday. And I began to read through that. And it was, you know, it was make coffee for everybody. It was open the doors and turn on the AC and get the record books and put them around every place and pick them back up. And it went through all of this list of one thing after another after another. And... And I, I want you to hear this. It's no leader is above doing any of those things. I, I can think of a time when, you know, I had a service. We had a couple of people saved. And, man, we had a great, and I was all juiced up. They had to hose me down after the service, man. And then somebody came after me and said, hey, pastor, the toilet's overflowing in the men's room. You know, I'm not a, listen, I've unclogged toilets. I've done it. I'm not above those things. But those things can take away from the priority of what we as staff and what pastors do. I'm, I, I believe the, the call of a pastor is that if Ephesians 4, 11, and 12, to equip the saints, to prepare them, to call them, to rally them together to do the work of ministry. That we're in this together to do the work of ministry. Now what I want to tell you is we're all busy. Amen. Some of y'all look worn out. I mean, you come out, you're worn out. We are, we are worn out. There are a lot of things going on in our lives. There's no doubt about it. You think of the, the single mom with three kids. You, you, think of the, you think of the man who's in a job where he's always traveling. You think of the man or the woman that's in a job and their, their job is in keeping them in constant rotation over and over again. You think of the college student. We have any college students back yet? We have a few college students. Yeah, look at them. They're still happy. They're about to get started. <laughs> Next week, college students will be back with us. Think of the college student up, up to up to her eyeballs and, and books and, and tests and, and research are, are, are about to get underway. And man, they say, look, I, I just don't have time to serve. 
I, I just have time to give. Uh, what about me time? What about me? Uh, and, and it'd be this. One of these days, one of these days, you can count on me. I'll be there. You know? Now, that, that brings us to our passage today in God's Word. And um, it, it is where Jesus really is teaching on serving, and he is, in these words, creating a serving revolution. Okay? Um, just a little background as we, before, before we, we, we read through some of these verses. A little background. Jesus is with his disciples, and he is on his way to the city of Jerusalem. It is, it is a couple of years or so into that journey of discipleship and preparation. And we know what is awaiting Jesus in Jerusalem. In fact, just a few verses before, in verses 17, if you want to look at that, in verses 17 uh, through 19, Jesus describes what is awaiting him in the city of Jerusalem. He says, when we get there, Son of Man is going to be betrayed by the chief priests and, betray, and, the, and the teachers of the law. They're going to condemn him to death. He's going to be turned over to the Gentiles. He's going to be scourged and crucified and die. But on the third day, he's going to raise from the dead. Now, I want you to see this. It went right over their heads. Because it's just the next verse that it says that the mother of Zebedee's uh, sons came to Jesus, came over to Jesus with her two sons, kneeling down and says, I, I got a favor to ask of you. And basically what she, what she says is, I've made a promise to my two sons here, James and John, I've made a promise to them that when you come into your new kingdom, one will be on the right and one will be on the left. They will have the, hold the positions of power and authority when they get into your new kingdom. And she is speaking for them, says there's no better qualified than my two sons. And Jesus is like, did you not just hear what I was talking about? Did you not just listen to what I said? Lady, you don't understand what you are asking because we know that when Jesus gets to, gets to Jerusalem, he's going to be crucified, and with him are two crucified, one on each side of him. You don't know what you're asking, uh, you know, and, and they all say, oh, yeah, we, we, we understand exactly. No. You said understand. Now, now look at the, let's begin to look at our passage here um, in verse, verse uh, 24. And, and notice, notice this is so true. When the ten heard about this, this is the ten of the twelve, right? When the ten heard about what had happened, they were indignant. What in the world does that mean? Just picture, I wish I had a picture of what indignant looked like. They were ticked off. They were upset. And the reason why they were upset is because these two guys had beat them to the punch. They were all talking about it. They've been talking about it. They're talking about when you get to the kingdom, what kind of role are you going to have when we get to Jerusalem? What's going to be your post in the kingdom you know, agenda? What are, what are you going to be doing when you get there? And they, they got there and they said, hey, mom, this is the time. And we're in there nailed behind him. We love you, Jesus. And they were ticked off. They were upset. They were frustrated because they had been beat to the, the punch. And Jesus basically calls a time, time out. And he gives a little lesson here. You see verse 25, he called them together, a little time out. And he said, you know that the rulers of Gentiles, we all know, we, we know of people that lord it over. They take their position of power and authority and they mash people down. They create fear. They they belittle people. They, whatever it is, we know examples. And they knew, they knew that the rulers of the Gentiles, they lorded over. They had had Gentiles that were in authority over their nation. They knew. They knew about some of the, the uh, rulers and what they did. Lorded over. 
how their officials exercise authority over them. Yeah. Okay, look at the next verse. Look at it. See verse 26? But this is not so for you. You're not about power and authority and, and elevating yourself. So he says that whoever of you wants to be great among you must be your servant. Talk about a serving revolution. Jesus is turning things upside down. This is not what they are anticipating, right? Whoever wants to be first, protos, be first, must be your slave. Very bottom. You, this is, you want to be great in the kingdom of Jesus, then begin by being a servant and understand what it is to be a servant. He is changing their attitude. He is changing their mindset and preparing them to be like him. In fact, this last verse, he offers himself as an example. Just as the Son of Man. He did not come to be served, but to serve. Instead of coming in as a political giant, setting up his kingdom, uh, his throne, Jesus came as a servant, a humble servant. His service took him all the way to the cross where he took our sin upon himself. Where he laid down his life that we might have life. That's what he did for us. To give himself as a ransom to pay the price for the many. This is the servant ethic. This is the servant ethic of the kingdom and of God's people. Considering others. Serving others. Mindful of others. Right, what, what, what do we do with this? How do we apply? How do we apply this? I, I was thinking through this the slide, go up that next slide. I was thinking through this uh, ways, you know, how, how we create a serving revolution. I was thinking maybe it should be how do, we, how do we continue the serving revolution that Jesus is teaching us here, how he turned things upside down. Well, there's just some quick thoughts that came to mind, for, you know, some declarative things. One is every disciple is called to serve. Everyone, every disciple is called to serve. Amen. I thought I heard an old man. Did you say old man? Called to serve. Every, <laughs> every area of service is important, even if you give a cup of water in the name of Jesus. It's important. That's kingdom work. If it's in his name, exalts his name. Make yourself available. Start somewhere serving. You know, you got to identify, and there's ways we can help you to do that, your spiritual gifts. How, what is your temperament, your personality, and use the experience that you have for the benefit of others. And then serve, listen, with integrity and excellence as though you're serving Jesus himself. You know, talk about an angel, angel unaware, right? But what if, what if there was a challenge? What if there's a challenge? And the challenge was to set aside two hours every week. Now, maybe that's too much. You, you decide. But let's say set aside two hours every week for the next 90 days or, or so. Two hours every week, every week for the next 90 days. And, and, and submit yourself and allow yourself to be used to serve others. Maybe it just includes writing a letter or a note of encouragement. Maybe it's visiting someone that's homebound. Maybe it is just entering into the prayer ministry. Maybe it's just getting on that, that 5.30 prayer time every morning and kicking in. 
Maybe it's coming over here on Thursday at, 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 uh, at 12.15 to 12.45 and praying for that 30 minutes with others for the move of God that God is, is, is promised and is giving our community. Maybe it's, uh, maybe it's involved in some mission work. Um, but, but you name it. it can work. Maybe, it's, maybe it's working in the preschool or coming alongside Margie and saying, Margie, how can we have... Listen, we have so many openings right now that are on, in, on Wednesday night with children uh, and, and Sunday morning. We, 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 have, we have needs with our reaching our, our, um, our youth and, and our kids' place. And I'm going to tell you something. If we don't have children, we are dead in the water. And we have got to reach families and children. Um, what, what, if, what, what if we just found that place, made ourselves available? I wonder what that would do. Because there, there is something revolutionary that happens in us when we serve in the name of Jesus. When we make a commitment and we sacrifice, we make a sacrifice in order to be there, in order to do that, in order to join the Lord where He is at work. And that is the joy that comes up in us. Because a, a serving revolution, I think, begins with a cause worth laying your life down for. And that cause is to find Jesus in the people that we serve. And just think of the joy that would come to that single mom of three kids that has said, I just got nothing to give. I don't have any time. But somehow makes that commitment. It says, Lord, I give you two hours this week to begin with. Show me where it works. Show me where. Just imagine the joy when that moment comes in her heart. She makes that sacrifice. Or that, that man or that woman whose job has them traveling all the time or they have... Or, or has them in rotation time and time again, and, and yet they take that to task. Lord, I want to join you in your work and in your activity. I want to be where you are, and I'm giving you this time. Show me. And, and the joy of the Lord that will come. Or the, or the college student, the college student, now you three or four college students are here, you, you pass the word around where you serve the joy that will come. Just imagine. Imagine as people come to the staff and they say, hey, I'm, I, I feel like God can use my gifts and abilities in this area. Imagine that, how that would cheer their hearts. Ma imagine what it, would, uh, what, what it would be like as people begin to come. And this happens every time because as new people add their selves to the context, along with them come new ideas. And along with them come creativity and comes a great excitement because we are able to see things. And God was just waiting for that person to arrive so that we could see it and enjoy it and be a part of it. And it was like God spoke in the midst of that. Just imagine what it would do for us if that one, that two, that three people said, I'm coming out of this spot to serve Jesus. I think it would make a tremendous difference. We're talking about a cause worth laying your life down for. And the desire to make a difference. And to hear him say, well done. For as you have done it to the least of one of these, you have done it for me.